Welcome back. We're talking about China's ongoing urbanization program. Let's get back to our panel. And Uwe, let's start in the studio here. Uh, we've heard about some of the challenges that China faces as it embarks on this rapid urbanization project and some of the opportunities that it provides as well. Uh, do you see it the same way? Yes, um, I do. I echo the concerns of, of, of the other panelists, but I would like to frame this in maybe a larger, uh, from a larger perspective, and that is uh, we as, as humans, we've been building cities for, for 5,000 years, and one of the things that sets China apart is that the contemporary cities, many of them have been around for quite a long time. I was recently in Wuhan, and they celebrate 3,000 years of being a trading city midway on the Yangtze River. Uh, today, that's translated into entirely new opportunities for them, uh, as I said before, really emerging as a global gateway city uh, in many new forms of, of, of manufacturing and, and economic production. Yeah. The issues of infrastructure are always challenging, but I wanted to underscore just how unprecedented the Chinese experience is. So just in the last 25 years, enormous amounts of innovation have occurred in how new infrastructure is conceived, planned, uh, and delivered, and it is having a dramatic impact on the quality of life uh, for people living in China, China in general and in Chinese cities in particular. So we shouldn't underestimate the positive outcomes associated with this process. Okay. Stefan, if we look at uh, one of the projects uh, currently underway in China, that's in the Beijing area. Uh, the idea is to turn that Beijing region into what's been called an urbanized economic nerve center, sometimes referred to as the Jing Jin Ji. Um, some planners are very excited by it. Others see a, logist a logistical disaster here. How do, you, uh, how do you assess this? What are the risks here? Yeah, well, this fits in a larger st strategy of clustering uh, cities rather than have one dominant city like Beijing where everybody works. And uh, this will lead to a lot of congestion, everyone going in the morning trying to get to the center and then in the afternoon, evening, everyone going back to the uh, peripheries. Uh, so building this network of, of cities and moving some of Beijing's functions uh, to other areas fits into that strategy. Uh, the big concern here is, uh, is it going to succeed, right? Are people actually going to move to uh, Xiong'an um, and uh, are they willing to uh, leave Beijing? And the second concern is the location of Xiong'an, which is actually uh, going to be built on uh, a, w a large wetland area, uh, which brings with it a lot of challenges. So those are some of the concerns. Uh, but by and large, it's a very um, ambitious project, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what's happening there. Yan Song, uh, how important is transport, moving workers around in these big urban conurbations that we are seeing in China? Uh, and if we look at this project that we were just talking about, uh, it will be cities, it will be satellite worker communities, industrial centers, factories, all linked by a rail network. Uh, they want workers to be within 30 minutes uh, of the place where they work. Uh, the goal is to have uh, a fluid labor market, uh, which would help economic growth. Will it work, do you think? Um, it's a great blueprint. However, um, when it comes to implementation, there are a lot of uh, details that need to be, need to be uh, really addressed. Uh, first of all, is the urban spatial structure wise sufficiently to support this kind of commuting pattern so that people can just commute 30 minutes uh, to work and, um, and get back, getting back to work um, after in the afternoon. So the, the urban spatial structure needs to be laid out in a sensible way to facilitate this type of uh, um, sort of a pattern. So this is the first thing. And secondly, um, would the labor market really support this type of a clustering of uh, uh, working forces? Um, people tend to be clustering in a, a center to um, enjoy economics of scale. Um, so if uh, the, in the plan, uh, multiple centers are being laid out to uh, decentralize the working force, uh, would that be sensible? So that's another key question to be addressed in the uh, uh, implementation scheme. Uh, Wei Bingyu, uh, what is the connection between what we're seeing in China now and its other, and its other goal of, uh, of transforming its economy, of, of not relying uh, on manufacturing uh, totally? 
and, and becoming more of a country that uh, depends on domestic consumption, you're going to have people moving into cities now. Uh, their standard of living is going to get better. They're going to have more disposable income. How does this all work together? Yes, um, this is one of the challenges, actually, when we look at tra uh, you know, traffic congestion in many large cities, is because on the other side of the coin, you have to promote the automobile industry, right? And that is a big engine of local growth for many cities. And this will come to the same center of question, that is, um, do we want to disperse people, or do we want to cluster them so that innovative activities happen more uh, you know, sort of actively. So we look at the uh, high-tech area in Beijing, in Zhongguancun, or we look at other places. The physical face-to-face -face contact is still very important. So as China moves towards a more of innovative in China pattern, I think we need to consider how labor market needs to be cultivated uh, not just sort of in the fashion of purely considering uh, the sort of less density. I think there's significant concern of density being too high, and the Chinese cities actually don't have very high densities as soon as we move out of the central city. So I think the move towards innovation-based economy will have to be part of the implementation, as you know, panelists have talked about, uh, in planning Chinese cities. Right, and Wei you, the other big question, of course, is investment in China's urbanization process. Where is the money coming from? You know, that's actually one thing that is unprecedented for Chinese cities. There is huge amount of state investment in infrastructure. In fact, much of infrastructure is a public investment, and some people would argue that amount of public investment has crowded out uh, foreign investors or private participation and indeed, as we see that uh, private participation, meaning from private companies or operators into the infrastructure sector, tends to be more what we call south to south investment, meaning firms from other Asian countries, Southeast Asia. Uh, so less from the um, Western industrialized countries as we will see in other emerging markets. So I think China now is promoting more and more openness in the infrastructure sectors. For instance, the water and sewage sector uh, is significantly open to uh, foreign and private uh, investment. Stefan, we've already seen China experience problems with things like pollution. And I'm wondering, with this urbanization project, how does it counter uh, pollution, even overcrowding in these new cities? Yeah, I, I can speak to a couple projects that uh, I'm currently working on. Um, I, I work for a, comp a company called KPF, and we do a lot of large uh, buildings, but also master planning uh, projects. And what's, what's really changing is uh, not just building for uh, hi highways and, and building for cars, but keeping uh, the pedestrian in mind. As you probably visited Beijing or or Shanghai, you, you'll get f familiar with uh, traffic jams and, and air pollution, people wearing masks. Uh, and really, this is related to uh, the pattern of urbanization, which was so much centered around highways. Uh, and if you look at the process of urban planning in China, it's, it's been centered around highway engineers that go in and they will build these big highways, and then later the urban development uh, comes second. But we can really see a new shift that's moving away from that type of planning to a more uh, holistic uh, process, looking not just at mobility, uh, but also at uh, the human scale, uh, at landscape, historic preservation. Uh, and the term that a lot of uh, planners are starting to use now is not so much of master planning, but of urban regeneration, which uh, denotes a more holistic process. So just to give you uh, one example, uh, we're working on this one project on the Shanghai West Bund. Uh, it's a Dong Jiedu. It's a new uh, financial center. Uh, and if you compare that to the financial center that was built in, in Shanghai 30 years ago uh, in Pudong, Lu Jiazui, uh, those are really big towers, but they didn't really quite meet the ground very nicely. There's no uh, green. Um, and instead, this project is uh, built around uh, a park, all the towers, they 
uh, we design them very carefully how they meet the ground so there's an interesting pedestrian experience uh, you can walk within 500 meters to go to a, a subway stop uh, and more importantly some of the historic buildings in the area have been uh, preserved to remain some of the uh, identity Yan Song, can I want to totally yeah. echo uh, what Stefan just made in yeah. his points uh, in quite a few of our uh, sort of the, uh, the cities that we researched it recently we found out that uh, as high as 30 to 40 percent of uh, uh, the, 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 the pollutants are coming out from the car emissions. Um, so just uh, echoing the point that uh, um, Stefan just mentioned in terms of um, how the highways um, have um, been one of the major contributors to air pollution. Um, thus, uh, many cities now in China began to realize this problem and put um, public transit as the policy priority to um, uh, reverse the trend of having too uh, much car or too many, uh, too much uh, the congestion in the cities. Right, and Yansong, can China draw on the experience of other countries, particularly countries in Southeast Asia, as it embarks on this project? Absolutely. Um, to some extent, the densities in many of the other Asian cities are even higher than uh, the uh, densities in Chinese cities. Uh, we look at Tokyo, for example, um, and Singapore and um, um, Hong Kong, um, and how they progress over time in terms of their uh, urbanization, how they have a really high uh, public transit ridership, um, right. at the same time maintaining sustainable um, urban future. So there are many things that um, um, China can learn from those uh, Asian cities, um, mostly in terms of um, uh, transportation management, um, smart city paradigms yeah. and uh, um, uh, environmental protection programs, uh, even from the Western cities. Well, of course, yeah. China can uh, learn from the experience of others, but it can also export its knowledge, yes. couldn't it? Especially to other developing countries, the countries of Africa, for example. Yes. Um, I think this is a major point. This is, a, uh, I think, a, a moment in time where we see that there is very significant urban planning and development experience that has been incubated within China that is uh, very valuable. Um, uh, the world is urbanizing. Um, the success stories within China in combating poverty and bringing prosperity to populations is, is, is very impressive. And um, with China's emerging focus on uh, the quality urban development, as we've heard the other panelists uh, discuss, uh, I do believe that more and more urban planning professionals around the world will be turning to look at China as a important precedent in how to do it right. Okay, and that's where we're going to have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Anand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.